Okay, so um, so I want to pick up where I left off yesterday. And so just as a reminder of uh, what we were doing yesterday, um, the setup was, you know, in some generality, we started off with some kind of Calabia threefold. And then associated it to moduli of objects, sheaves, complexes, whatever, on the Calabia threefold. And then we, you know, produce essentially a, a constructible function on this moduli space, the z value constructible function, which has the property that, it, you know, if you're in the proper situation and you have these kinds of virtual invariants in the sense of intersection theory, that this constructible function uh, recovers that information. If you kind of, you have some notion of integrating a constructible function where you add up the Euler characteristics of the strata weighted by the value, and this kind of recovers this virtual class invariant that was defined in Richard's lectures. And so what I wanted to, you know, kind of talk about first today is give kind of, you know, an indication of why this is kind of a, such a powerful tool. And there'll be something that I'm going to want anyways for uh, later on in this course. And so, so the kind of moduli space I'm going to take is what's called the stable pairs moduli space or the PT moduli space sometimes for Ponder, Ponde, and Thomas. And so the data here is, uh, it's two pieces of data. And this is kind of a moduli space that's meant to reflect some kind of curve counting invariant. So first you have a, a sheaf, E, which is one dimensional and pure. It has no zero dimensional subsheaf. And then you have a section of the sheet with the stability property, which I forgot to write, that the co-kernel is zero dimensional. So this has one of these, you know, uh, you know, symmetric obstruction theories or whatever from yesterday. And so we can take its um, the virtual invariant and we could sum them up in a generating function. It's not hard. It's, to, to see that this ends up being a, a, Laurent, uh, a Laurent series in the sense that for n sufficiently negative, uh, these moduli spaces are empty. And the theorem is that um, this generating function is actually, first of all, a rash, uh, the expansion of a rational function in Q, and it has this kind of Q goes to one over Q symmetry. And so this was proven in this generality by Toda and Bridgeland. Um, and so what I want to kind of first do is kind of sketch the proof in the kind of simpler case. When uh, beta, the curve class, which is the, you know, the support of the one dimensional sheaf is uh, irreducible. So that means, you know, if you like all the curves that appear in this class or beta is not of the form beta one plus beta two with the uh, beta i effective. So all the curves that kind of appear, which have support beta are in fact uh, integral curves. And in the, the proof in this case, this is actually one of the first, uh, this is kind of originally done by Ponder, Ponde and Thomas. And what, you know, what the, the reason I wanna give this proof is really just to kind of indicate kind of the power of this ability to kind of work constructively instead of working intersection theoretically. This, this property of being a rational function is supposed to be true when you do curve counting on any threefold using the stable Paris moduli space, but we don't really know how to prove it in that generality. So you can do them. Okay. And so, um, so I'll, I, I don't want to get too much into the details. I'll just state what kind of where the constructability ends up being useful, where in particular, how you kind of see both this rationality and this symmetry. And so the kind of idea is that, you know, To prove this kind of, you know, rationality and symmetry, it's actually enough. So for instance, um, if it were a Laurent polynomial, the symmetry would just say that, the, you know, the Q to the N coefficient is the same as the Q to the negative N coefficient. Um, this statement is a little weaker than that because you can have a, a rational function with poles. And so instead, uh, what you end up showing is, um, so let's call this virtual degree for the given moduli space, I'll call it PT beta comma N. And so if I compare the Q to the N coefficient with the Q to the minus N coefficient, it's enough to show that this is basically of this form, some constant times negative one to the N minus one. Times. It just, this is just some statement about power series. If the constant were zero, then you would get an honest to God Laurent polynomial. And the idea is that this statement is something you can check kind of strata by strata on the on the moduli space. More precisely, 
if I look at this pairs moduli space for n and the pairs moduli space for negative n, I have a forgetful map where I can just forget the section. And this will go to kind of m beta n, which is you know some the space of you know one dimensional sheaves, you know, with these discrete invariants. And similarly, I have a forgetful map here. And then I have, I have a natural isomorphism between these two spaces, which sends um, a sheaf E, what I'll call, you know, E dual, which is, um, this sheaf here. So this is again, some kind of pure one dimensional sheaf with the same support. And the way you should, the way you should think about it is that for instance, if the support were like a smooth curve and E was like the push forward of a line bundle, then this dual would be the push forward of the dual line bundle tensor, the canonical bundle of the curve. And so now to prove this kind of identity where I want to compare the invariant for n with the invariant of negative n, I can study it using, this, using the fact that the invariant is somehow defined now constructively. I can try to study this difference, you know, fiber by fiber. Let's call this map pi sub n. I'll call this map pi sub negative n. Using this identification of the two bases. And so it turns out, well, what is, if I pick a point, if I fix a sheaf, the fiber in one projection is the projectivization of global sections of the sheet. You see the support is irreducible. So this, uh, the, this business about the co-kernel being non-zero just means that the, uh, the section is non-zero. And similarly, if I look at the fiber with respect to the you know, other projection, well, it's given by the projectivization of this H zero, which if you kind of you know, mess around with duality ends up being naturally identified with H1 of the original sheet E. So the idea is that both of these are kind of, you know, uh, you know, the fibers are always projective spaces, but the, the dimension of the projective space jumps around. But since I'm working constructively, it doesn't matter. I can just kind of assume I have a projective bundle. And then when I want to kind of compare the difference, well, I'm just taking an Euler characteristic. And so the difference in the Euler characteristics well, let's see. Um, I'm just going to be taking the integral of my Baron function just over each of these fibers. Now there's one thing I need, which is that what, I need to know something about the value of the Baron function here. And the key fact that they prove is that the, basically that the Baron function on the kind of PT space is just pulled back from the Baron function on the base. So it turns out that here, I'm gonna use some fact that the Baron function is constant on fiber. So it's up to assign the pullback of the Baron function downstairs. And so as a result, you know, once I kind of sort out the signs, I get exactly the statement I want. The difference between the, you know, the Euler characteristic of this projective space minus the Euler characteristic of this projective space is exactly H0 minus H1, which is an Euler characteristic. And so then when I now kind of integrate over the base, when I kind of add up over all the strata of M, I get exactly this kind of identity.
And so really this, this is kind of the, you know, the, why, why this is such a useful idea. You kind of just focus, you know, fiber by fiber, and you can actually then turn that into an argument about the global invariance. So let me just say a couple of remarks about this. So I, it was maybe not clear from what I said, but I, I was using the fact that the uh, curve class was irreducible, you know, in a bunch of different ways. That's why this kind of argument is so clean. In general, you have to kind of be much more kind of uh, clever. So you need this kind of much more complicated um, Paul algebra technology uh, of the kind that, you know, is hopefully the subject of uh, Veronica's lectures. Um, second, you know, <laughs> yes. Um, there's a question about the proof. So is it obvious that the Bayesian function pulls back? No, it's not. This is, this is something that, well, it's not hard actually, but this requires some proof. It's like a one page argument. And in fact, I mean, what's going on in the argument, there are a few different ways of thinking about it, but ultimately, you know, it's, it's, um, it's something that they, they prove using, you know, um, the fact that the, the Baron function behaves well with respect to smooth maps and so on. And the fact that the Baron function in some sense is really, a, you know, can be detected at the level of the schemes without keeping track of all the uh, obstruction theory and stuff like that. So, but this really requires an argument. Cool. Okay, so maybe the, maybe the second remark is that, um, you know, this rationality is much more general. This is what I said before, this should always hold. Once you kind of put some, you know, cohomology classes to cut the virtual dimension down to zero, but we don't really, you know, right now that we, I don't, we don't really, we can't access it in that kind of generality. Although there's some kind of recent announced work of dominant choice that might kind of change that situation. The third remark has to do with this, you know, question about the Baron function. So, so here I was really, you know, the Baron function was really along for the ride. What was important was that I was kind of, could kind of study this question uh, constructively. And really then, and then I needed to check something about the Baron function, but basically I needed to check that the Baron function was kind of, you know, constant on fibers. And so in particular, this entire argument would work if you replaced the Baron function with something that was constant. So this would work. If you somehow for, you know, replaced this weight function that you're weighting everything by, by something constant, or maybe, you know, a sign or something like that. And so in particular, this rationality, I mean, this was actually originally what, uh, what you can overprove. This rationality of this series is actually something about the actual Euler, topological Euler characters, because it's also not just the virtual invariance. But tomorrow I will kind of, I'll state a stronger rational, rationality conjecture, meaning a, a more kind of uh, constrained uh, version about what these uh, what these rational functions are. Um, which only holds. So unlike this kind of weaker statement, which this only holds um, in the virtual setting. And it's still open, even in the even in the Calabiao case. Okay, so I'll I'll talk about this tomorrow.
actually, um, Andre, could you do me a favor? <laughs> could you uh, could you uh, repost? You know the link. If you're, I don't know if you're online, but you know there's a link to that uh, to that uh, uh, the backup. Yeah, right. uh, could you but repost that? For me. So I tried using Say it, what? but I don't see. I don't. See oh, it, is, is it not working? Oh, hold on. Oh, is that is is it not working for you? I just see the initial state. You get oh, a link he shared. Can you access it? The host one or the participant one? Well, the one that you sent to everyone. In the, the Google chat. Drive? The Google Drive. So I just see the, oh, I see it now. Yeah, it's working now. Yes. Oh, OK. All right, good. Okay. Could you just repost the link, actually? I'm not sure if it. Uh... I will. Yeah, yeah. I got it. OK. So. What I'd like to talk about uh, for the rest of today is so, okay, so in general now, let's go back to this kind of generality where we have X, we have some moduli space, add them with X, and then we have this kind of constructible function on it. And so what we'd like to, what I want to kind of explain is how to kind of promote this story to um, with some kind of cohomology theory associated my moduli space with the property that the you know the virtual invariance will just be the you know alternating sum of the Betty numbers and so what we'll actually do is we'll actually kind of you know construct um, An object here, I'll call, which I'll call the you know the DT sheet on M, and you know what this will be is you well you should think of this as uh, this will end up being a a, a perverse sheaf on M, but to, you know to first approximation you, you could first think of this as a like a, a constructible sheaf or a complex of constructible sheaves or something like that. And then uh, what this We'll have the property is that if I, for instance, take the stockwise Euler characteristic at some point, um, this will recover the value of the Baron function at that point. And then if I take, you know, the global cohomology and I take the Euler characteristic, that'll be like integrating the Baron function, which in particular gives me the virtual number. I just want to make, make one point, which is always a little confusing, is that, you know, on the one hand, that when you know when we do these moduli problems, we're doing moduli of coherent sheaves on X. This object here is really a constructible sheaf, you know, with respect to the. So I'm thinking of the, you know, taking the analytic topology and so on. Okay. Um, so what is the idea behind this construction? Uh, it has to do with something that I said yesterday, which was a kind of, you know, one of the examples of where, you know, I said what the Baron function was, which is where I had a smooth variety with the function on it. And then the kind of mod space I was looking at was the critical locus of F, which is just the zero locus of the differential of F. And then in this setting, you know, the, the Baron function at a point was you know something like negative one to the dimension of v one minus the topological Euler characteristic of the the Milner fiber at this point. And so the idea is that if I want to kind of promote this down to instead of just a, a number to some kind of you know cohomology, what I can do is instead of just taking the Euler characteristic of this Milner fiber, I could just take the cohomology of the Milner fiber and you know. And then do that as p varies around m to get a to get a, a, a sheaf or a complex of sheaves. So um, there is a uh, standard way of doing this. You 
using this notion of what are called a vanishing cycles. Vanishing cycles, you know, in a word is kind of measured, if I think of this as a, a family of varieties over A1, vanishing cycles measures the, you know, difference in cohomology between the singular fiber and the smooth general fiber. It's a way, it's a way that kind of set that up. I have V over A1, which is my function. Unless I'm interested in the fiber over zero, which I'm gonna assume is singular. I can take the, first of all, the complement of zero and its universal cover. And then take the corresponding Cartesian diagram. And let's call, you know, these inclusions, let's call this one I, and let's call this inclusion all the way here from the universal, you know, from the pullback of the universal cover all the way back to my original variety. I'll call that, uh, let's say J tilde. <laughs> I can do the following. I'm going to produce a uh, a sheaf on uh, on on the central fiber of V zero, or really a complex of sheaves, where I do the following. I can take the constant sheaf on V, and then I can you know pull it back and then push it forward back to V, and then restrict this to the central fiber. So this is what's called. I'll call this. By Q. And the way, the way you should think about this is that if I look at the, the stock of this at a point, um, this is like this, um, the, this, the cohomology of this Milner fiber at that point. But now if I wanna do you know, the analog of this, you know, one minus and so on, I wanna kind of, this is like taking reduced cohomology. So to, to kind of do that construction, I have a, just from a junction, I get a map So this is all happening in this kind of derived category of constructible sheaves. And then I can just take the cone, which I'll call EQ. And so again, up to shifts and so on, this is really the analog of taking, you know, this, uh, this reduced Milner fiber to get the Baron function. And again, what this is, you're supposed to think about this is measuring the kind of the difference in to, uh, topology between the, the, the nearby fiber and the kind of close, the singular closed fi uh, fiber over zero. And so once I throw in a shift, um, these two operations, I could, instead of taking the constant sheaf, I could have taken any sheaf on V. And these two operations define um, uh, functors from, you know, sheaves on V to sheaves on V0. So this lives on kind of, you know, sheaves on V0. And in fact, uh, kind of the, the surprising thing is that they preserve kind of this uh, abelian category of perverse sheaves. So I have phi sub F, which goes from perverse sheaves on sheaves on v0 and also also size of f but this is the one that i'm going to be interested in okay there's a, there's kind of a lot going on here <laughs> so i really i mean what i really want to encourage you to do is just to think of this as this original definition where i took the this reduced uh, Euler characteristic and replace it instead with reduced cohomology. And then imagine doing that in families to get an actual complex of sheaves. And so in particular, the, the specific object that we'll be interested in is where I take in the constant sheaf on V. Well, the constant sheaf on V isn't quite perverse. It has to, you have to shift it. So instead I'll take, um,
this object here, which is a reverse sheaf on the zero fiber that's supported on the critical locus. And in particular, it has the property, I'll just call this, you know, phi sub m. It has the property that it's stockwise Euler characteristic is exactly this Baron function. And so the goal in which I want, I'm going to sketch is that we basically want to kind of take these kinds of things and glue them together. But to do that, I have to argue why this is even a good local model. I have to really... And so actually, I mean, there are a few ways of thinking about this. So again, so now let's go back to our situation where I have X and the corresponding moduli space M of X. And what I'd like to argue is that at least locally on M, this, this you know, my space looks like something where I'm taking the critical locus of a function. And so this is actually easier to think about if you're willing to work uh, analytically or, you know, kind of formal locally. So for instance, in the kind of gauge theory world, where let's say M of X is like a moduli of like vector bundles. The way you could try to model what your, you know, moduli spice looks like is you could take a, you know, a C infinity bundle and then what you're interested in doing is putting some kind of holomorphic structure on it so you're kind of looking for you know an integrable d bar connection on sections of e and so if you you know write any such kind of you know zero one operator in terms of some kind of base one plus some kind of correction where this correction is like a zero one form on the endomorphisms. Then it turns out that you can write down the integrability condition purely in terms of a critical locus condition. You can write down what's called the holomorphic churn Simon functional, which is some explicit integral over X. X is Calabiao, so you have, let's say, a you know, holomorphic three form. And then you kind of, you just kind of cook up some, <laughs> some zero three form to kind of compensate it. So this is, this was actually what was first written down as far as I know in Richard, Richard's thesis. All right, whatever. This is, you know, this is this is some kind of explicit construction that you can do that picks out exactly the condition that you want. And this is modeled off of an analogous condition in uh, for real three manifolds. But this is not the only way of thinking about this, actually. For instance, the, the approach that I like the best is uh, using deformation theory. And this works much more generally. If I give you some point in my moduli space, so some object on X, then if I look at the formal completion of my moduli space in this, at this point, well, anytime you have a scheme and you take the formal completion, you can embed it inside of you know, the formal completion of the tangent space at this point, which in this case is just some x to one. And then you can actually write down explicitly a power series on this tangent space that whose critical locus cuts this out. So the idea is that if I look at the x to algebra of my object, 
it carries a, a product, the Yoneda product, but it actually carries higher operations, basically massive products. Induced by the fact that the way I get this is I take the cohomology of some differential graded algebra. So you have uh, these higher operations go from, once you know, write them down, they, you can go from, they go from, you know, symmetric power of X1 to X2. And then you can just write down a formal function on X1, which is just the sum. Uh, with, I might screw up the denominators, but I think this is right. And here, uh, what's going on is that here, this pairing that I'm using is exactly the Serre duality pairing. And so what you then show is that this formal completion is just literally the critical locus of this, of this formal power series. Okay. So there are a few ways of thinking about this. I, I should say both of them, you know, at the Kalabi out condition showed up in some pivotal way. Here it showed up because I was taking a holomorphic three form. Here it was showing up because I was using the fact that I have a pairing, a natural pairing between X1 and X2, which in some precise sense is compatible with these operations. Do you mind giving us a bit more details about what just happened? Because I'm a bit confused as to what F is here. Oh, oh, oh right. So, um, okay, yeah, maybe I maybe I shouldn't have gone into this. I, what I was trying to do is I, I was trying to kind of give some idea of why the moduli spaces that are showing up are actually critical loci, at least locally. Correct. And so, in the in the if you're willing, if you're kind of comfortable in the gauge theory world, you can see it for vector bundles just by explicitly writing down this. Um, Functional. If I took the derivative of this functional with respect to a, this is some infinite dimensional thing. So you have to kind of, you know, deal with that. Then you get exactly the integrability condition, which is something like you know, d bar a plus you know a commutator a is equal to zero. So that kind of falls out exactly here. What's less clear is why uh, this kind of formal thing also works. Uh, but I just wanted to indicate that, that there is a way of making sense of this purely algebraically without thinking about gauge theory. But so maybe 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 it's better best not to get into this. <laughs> um, but I, I just want to indicate that there is a picture that lets you kind of talk about in kind of much more generality how to see this critical structure. So uh, thinking about this, we have one more question: Is this some sort of a infinity a deformation theory? Yeah, that, that's exactly what the, I mean. This, this higher operations is. I'm thinking of this as an a infinity algebra, and then the the Serre duality. Um, is giving me the structure of what's called a cyclic A infinity algebra. And so then there's some kind of general theory um, about you know, understanding your moduli problem as um, uh, in terms of uh, the in, ter in terms of exactly the critical in, in terms of the critical of this thing. So there's some, let's see, a, a reference for this. Uh, there's you know basically there's some nice notes of Kinsevich and Soigelman from like the 2000s that kind of discuss this. But I, there, I'm sure there are other places as well. I mean, in general, I mean, okay, this is kind of a tangent. In general, even if I don't have a Kalabi Yau, if I want to understand what are the equations cutting out this formal completion inside of the tangent space, you can always, you're always just looking for the zero locus of these, you know, of these formal functions, which go from X1 to X2. Um, and then what's special in the Kalabi Yau case is that you can take all of those uh, functions and group them together as, as coming from derivatives of this one power series. Okay, well, okay, maybe, 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 um, maybe that was a bad thing to try to emphasize because these kinds of, these kinds of results are nice, but they don't really, <laughs> they work analytic locally or formal locally. And what, what ends up, what you really need is something, a, a much more stronger result, um, which is due to kind of Pantev, Cohen, uh, Vakier, and Vesozzi, and then uh, Chris Brav, uh, Vittorio Busi, and Dominic Joyce. Which says that again, so if I have my moduli problem, my moduli space, and I take some point on it, and I'm assuming I'm the kind of the, the scheme setting, so m of x is a scheme, there exists a Zariski open. Uh, 
chart for my point, which can be written as the critical locus of a function on a smooth, smooth scheme. So these kinds of, you know, deformation theory arguments or gate theory arguments only give you kind of, you know, very, you know, you know small, maybe, you know, assuming you could show convergence, you'd get really just like an analytic open where this is true. What's kind of striking about this result is that you really get kind of a Zariski open set where it's true. And this, this proof is really much harder. You see, the idea is that these guys, the, the first paper introduced this notion of what are called minus one shifted uh, symplectic structures, which is really a notion that's kind of properly in the world of derived geometry. And then the second group kind of proved that there is a, essentially a, a local structure theorem, a Zariski local structure theorem for whatever these symplectic structures are. What I like about this result, by the way, other than the fact that it's just a, like a cool result, is that um, it really kind of in a strong way uses uh, uh, derived geometry in the sense that, you know, a lot of the other constructions in the subject, like, you know, all the stuff about like obstruction theories and virtual classes are kind of, you know, dodges to get around having to actually work with, you know, derived schemes directly. And th this result really, I don't, there's no, as far as I know, anywhere, there's no real way around it. Um, and so any kind of construction that builds on it, which is you know, what I'll be doing for the rest of the lecture, ultimately really kind of relies on that kind of formalism in an essential way. So let me just say, um, we've seen already some example of, so for the most part, this theorem tells you that you have uh, these Zariski local kind of critical charts where you have this critical locus description, it doesn't really give you some very good idea of how to find them or how to find the function and so on. Um, but in some examples, you know, you can actually see it explicitly. We've seen some examples already. So for instance, there was an example from yesterday where I had this kind of, you know, three, three hypersurface inside of P2 cross P2. And then I wrote, I just get some explicit moduli space and I described it as a, a critical locus of a function. Another example that I like a lot, where again, you can actually write down a global critical locus description is the case of the Hilbert scheme of points on C3. Here, the ambient space that you work with So you can think of the um, Hilbert scheme of points on C3 is giving you, you know, three commuting matrices on C to the N along with, um, you know, cyclic vector modulo conjugation. And so that the commuting condition kind of imposes some strong singularities. So the ambient smooth space is I'm just going to take three matrices on C to the N kind of, you know, a cyclic vector V inside of CN, and then that's it. <laughs> and then I mod out by the action of GLN. So this, the cyclic vector just means that if I take X, Y, and Z and I apply it to V, eventually it spans all of C to the N. So this is a smooth space. And then the way I Think of the Hilbert scheme inside of this smooth space. Is this is the critical locus of an explicit function, which is just a trace of x times the commutator of y and z. If you just explicitly calculate what the critical locus condition is, I just take the derivatives and set them to zero. It exactly picks out the condition that the matrices commute. And this is a really good, this is a really nice example because you know, it's explicit enough that you can imagine you can actually try to like calculate Milner fibers and so on. But of course, as N is big, it also gets kind of unwieldy. So 
So I won't maybe go into any de too much detail about here, but you know, you know what I've said already is that m of x is basically covered by what you know what we call these critical charts, which again just some description of open sets, which are described as critical loci. And then you know. Not surprisingly, there's also some kind of compatibility on overlaps. And this, you know, one way of thinking about this compatibility is what's known as the notion of what's called a D-critical scheme, which is basically some notion that was developed by uh, Dominic Joyce to avoid having to talk about these shifted symplectic structures all the time. Okay. So what we would like to do then is the following. So on each of these critical charts, I have a, this perverse sheaf that I've constructed on, on U. So if the chart is given by this data of U, V, and F, where U is the actual open set of MFX, I've produced this object, which is this vanishing cycles. essentially the constant sheaf, and you would like to glue these together. But uh, there's a problem with doing this. And this problem is kind of, uh, there's an obstruction to doing this gluing, which you can think of already in the kind of the simplest case, which is I suppose V, you know, V is, so let's say some smooth variety. And I can think of V as a critical locus on itself by just taking the zero function. And if I run through this construction, so that, okay, so the critical locus of F in this case is just V itself. And then this kind of you know vanishing cycles object that I'm going to produce is just a uh, it's just a constant sheaf with again with this shift. But there's another way of getting v as a critical locus, which is that what I can do is I can take let's say uh, I'll call L to some Z mod two local system. On V, so assume V has non-trivial local systems, and then I can take the corresponding, you know, two torsion line bundle, and then I can write down a function on the total space. All this. F tilde, which is basically just fiber wise, you know, T going to T squared. So using the fact that the L squared is trivial. And so it's not hard to see that if I take the critical locus of this thing on this bigger space, it's again just equal to V. But now if I uh, calculate the vanishing cycles, I don't get the constant sheaf anymore. I get this kind of rank one local system associated to L. So depending on how I described, um, you know, V is a critical locus, I either got a constant sheaf or I got this kind of Z mod two local system. And so this is gonna cause some kind of problem when I try to kind of match things on overlaps to kind of produce a global object. So to solve this, you actually need, there's, you need a little bit of extra structure. Which is something that already came up a little in Richard's talks and it came up essentially for similar reasons. So on my moduli space, I have this two term complex, this kind of obstruction theory, which is if you like the dual of my complex of deformations and destructions. And 
what we call the, the virtual canonical bundle is just the determinant of this thing, which is a line bundle on my moduli space. And so the extra structure that we need is what's called an orientation. It's just a choice of square root of this line bundle. And it turns out once I pick this choice globally, then uh, then I can kind of solve this problem about doing so the theorem, uh, which is due to let's see, Brav, uh, Bussy, Dupont, Joyce, and Sendroy. Is that if I take my moduli space and choose an orientation. choose the square root, then you can kind of solve this gluing problem. Which we'll call this DT sheaf, which is now some perverse sheaf that lives globally on your moduli space. And this choice, this choice really makes a difference. So first of all, there's a question about like, why does, why does the square root even exist? And then if, you know, choices will differ by like two torsion line bundles on M, how does that affect the answer? And then the first thing to point out is it really does affect the answer. So different choices will kind of change this DT sheaf by tensoring with this kind of local system. Which seems like a mild thing, but when I kind of, for instance, take cohomology, it'll totally just change the what the cohomology is. What is its orientation in the kind of the critical case? So, for instance, if M is just globally a critical locus, then uh, well, so the obstruction theory in this case, as you might remember, it looks like. Um, this two-term complex coming from the Hessian of F. If I take the determinant of this, I get the canonical bundle of V restricted to M squared. And so then the kind of the natural orientation, if you have a global critical locus is just to take KV restricted to M is kind of the natural choice. But of course, depends on my description as a, as a global critical locus. But for instance, in the example of like the Hilbert scheme or something where I give you some kind of nice function that cuts it out, then that in particular gives me also a nice orientation that cuts it out. Another example where there's a natural choice this is kind of one case where there's a natural choice. Another example where there's a natural choice is when my Calabiat threefold is the total space of the canonical bundle on the surface. So again, this is the kind of geometry that shows up in, showed up in Richard's talks uh, last week on the waffle witten theory. In that case, if I consider, for instance, you know, sheaves on X that are kind of proper over S, I have a map where I kind of take this sheaf on X and I just take its push forward to S and I get a point in the moduli stack of sheaves on S. So this is E maps to pi lower star E. And let's just assume I'm in a situation where this push forward is, you know, <clears throat> you know, coherent or has. Then, you know, there exists a natural orientation. M of X
that you can think of just by looking at what the, the, the how to think about the obstruction theory on MF on MFX. So you. This RHOM is what you know. Basically, the determinant of this is going to calculate my abstract, uh, my uh, virtual canonical bundle. And I can trap this in terms of two complexes that are you know built out of F. So on one hand, I can. This is built out of RHOM FF, and then the kind of other piece of the triangle is RHOM of F, F tensor KS with a shift here. And so then, well, if I combine shared duality with just taking, you know, the determinant of this is going to be the product of the terms of these two things. I combine that with shared duality, I get that the canonical bundle on MFX is naturally um, the pullback of the virtual, the virtual canonical bundle on MFS uh, squared. And so again, this gives me a natural choice of square root. But in general, you know, a priori, it's not clear that they even exist, let alone that it's kind of a nice choice. And so the kind of two theorems that kind of help with this is first of all, there's a very soft theorem. If I had more time, I would kind of explain the proof of this um, due to Nekrasov and Okunkov, which is that orientations always exist. And their argument is in kind of very great generality. Anytime you have some kind of, you know, moduli of objects on a Calabi out in a Calabi out three category or something like that. But they don't tell you how to pick it. And so then the more recent theorem from a couple of years ago of Dominic Joyce and Marcus uh, Upmeyer is that, okay, so I'm not actually sure about the precise hypothesis. So maybe, Maybe it's important for them that it's a projective Calabi out threefold. Um, so maybe, maybe this might not be exactly correct. Um, they kind of provide a kind of a canonical choice. And in particular, what's great about what they've done is that it's a, it's a, a choice that's kind of compatible with kind of varying the moduli space under things like extensions and direct sums and so on. But their, their proof is heavily gauge theoretic. I have to confess, I mean, at some point I was meeting with them and they were explaining to me and I, you know, if I understand correctly, which maybe, maybe this is wrong, but it's like they, what they do is they take the Calabi at threefold and they cross it with a circle. And then they kind of do some analysis about the corresponding real seven manifolds and some, some kind of special holonomy for those things. Um, so at least from my point of view, I don't really understand. I don't have a good feel for what's going on in this theorem, in this second theorem. Right, so I'm almost out of time. So now we can just, I can just state the upshot of all of this though, all this kind of formalism. This is pretty much all I'll need is that, you know, we started off with X, we took M of X, we maybe have to choose the square root, which, you know, maybe the choice has been made for us or maybe we are in a situation where we have a natural choice. And that produces this kind of DT sheath that lives, that's some perverse sheath that lives on my moduli space. And then if I wanna, for instance, kind of get a cohomology associated to my moduli space, I can just take the, uh, you know, the hyper cohomology of, of this perverse sheath. And so what properties does this satisfy? Well, first, I mean, the first one is the thing that I said at the beginning, which is that if I take the stockwise Euler characteristic, I get exactly the Baron function. That's really cooked into how we kind of pick this choice of phi to glue. If I instead take, you know, the global cohomology and I take the other characteristic there. Well, 
well, this is the integral of the Baron function, which in particular is my virtual invariant. What else? Well, we get some properties that just come from the fact that, you know, vanishing cycles have some nice properties. So for instance, um, this DT sheaf is closed undertaking uh, duels, Verdier duels, which concretely means that if I take the kind of homology, it's naturally dual, uh, dual to the kind of compactly supported homology. So for instance, if M is proper, you basically get Poincaré duality. What else? I mean, this won't be relevant for me, but this is extremely uh, interesting and useful in general, is that um, everything here can be kind of, you know, decorated with Hodge structures. So the, the kind of formal way of doing it is that, you know, this phi lifts to this category of uh, what are called the uh, mixed Hodge modules. And, but concretely what that means in practice is that then when I take global sections, this carries a natural mixed Hodge structure. And this is extremely useful for calculations. And so finally, let me just state a non-property, <laughs> which is that, um, you know, one of the things I mentioned in class uh, yesterday was that, um, well, the virtual class by, vir you know, because it is um, defined by intersection theory has a property that is deformation invariant. So if you have a family of X, X's, and you're in the proper situation, then the virtual degree is going to be independent of where you are in the family. And if you translate that to a statement of a bar barren function, it's something kind of very non-obvious because the actual family of moduli spaces, well, maybe it's proper, but it doesn't have to be flat or anything like that. So we know this kind of, you know, so if M is proper, then by virtue of this kind of, you know, index formula from yesterday, uh, this weighted Euler characteristic is uh, deformation invariant. as X varies. But that's not gonna be true for this kind of uh, cohomological thing. Um, you can, you know, a simple example to see how things can go wrong is where you consider the following family. These aren't really moduli spaces, just a family of things that have this kind of, you know, that are, you know, kind of critical structure, which is you just take a, I'm just going to take a, a Riemann surface M, a V, C, C. And then I'm going to just take a omega to be a, a one form on it, one more one form. And then I'll define a family of spaces, which is just uh, the zero locus of um, T times omega. So when T is non-zero, um, I just get a bunch of points corresponding to the zeros of my, uh, of omega. And in that case, you can just see, well, the, you know, everything is isolated. So the, the, the cohomology is all supported in degree zero and you just get, you know, Q to the 2G minus two in degree zero. But T equals zero, I get the entire curve. The, the vanishing cohomology in that case, the, 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 the phi in that case is just the constant sheaf up to a shift. And then now when I take the cohomology, 
it lives in different degrees, you know, it gives up Q, Q to the 2G and Q. And of course, these have the same Euler characteristics, but they're just different. And so in general, you know, that, that makes this problem a little bit subtle. If I'm working with, for instance, if I'm interested in like, you know, the quintic threefold, it's a not at all, you know, it doesn't really make sense to talk about in general, these kinds of, you know, these kinds of cohomological invariants for a moduli space sheets on a quintic threefold. You have to tell me which quintic threefold. Like in general, there's no reason to expect the answer to be insensitive to it. All right, let me uh, stop here. Do we have questions? We have one from the chat. I can uh, try asking it myself, but I'm not sure I'll be able to. So uh, the question is, if we actually think that the question is, if the orientation data on the on the stack of compactly supported per complexes is if it comes from the global one of Joyce Upmeyer. Oh yeah, that's a good question. So this is like, I mean, so I I actually don't know if can I see this QA maybe it's answered, it's in the answer tab. Okay, you can oh I, oh I see. There's a long discussion here. I the short answer uh, so Okay, hold on. If you could expand the stack where you know, this is from Boyko, is that correct? I mean, he would know better than me, but um, um, let's see, make sure I try to understand this question. I was wondering, oh, I see. Does the canonical Hilbert scheme orientation data come from the global one of Joyce Upmeyer? I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, again, I, th I, think, uh, I think he's in a better position to answer this question than I am. But what I'll say is that, um, you know, again, it's, it's a gauge theory construction. So if you have like a torsion sheath, um, the very first step is you're going to kind of, you know, you know, let's say you're interested in like, a, you know, something on C3, well, you're going to embed C3 as I understand their argument inside of like something compact, or maybe, you know, maybe you'll put, do some kind of boundary and framing or something like that. But then you're going to resolve your torsion sheath by vector bundles. And so then you lose a lot of this structure. Like, so for, I think even for this, even for a hill, but it's not clear to me, um, that their construction will agree um, with with this kind of what I was calling the what I was calling the canonical one, which is maybe not not the right choice of word. Um, okay. But but um, but so so you know so a priori it's different setting because they're working in a compact setting. But for instance, you know you could in an analytic neighborhood or something you can you know identify these two moduli spaces, and then it's not clear to me that those two orientations agree. But again, I'm not really the I'm not really the person to ask there. One more one more question in the Q and A. In the local case, there isn't a canonical one. Oh, it's an answer to what you said. In the local case, there isn't a canonical one. You could prove that there is one depending on a choice of compactification. Okay. All right. So, a question is an answer, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Not, then let's thank the mission again. Thank you.